the debt warriors listening and welcome back to another episode of millennial debt domination i'm your host katie fada student loans are such a hot topic for millennials and gen zers in fact if you're a millennial listening there's a good chance you're currently paying your student loans off and if you're a gen zer you've probably done or are currently doing research on what loans you're going to take out for college or grad school Since it's such a hot topic, we're going to be doing a three-part series on student loans starting with this episode. In this episode, I'll be joined by Randy Gosselin, who is a credit counselor specializing in student loan counseling at Navicore Solutions. Randy and I will be going over the basics of researching your student loans before you attend college or grad school and repaying your student loans after you graduate. We'll also be discussing the student loan forgiveness plan, refinancing your student loans, and how student loan debt can affect a person's mental health. Also, before I get to the interview, I just wanted to remind everyone that we're preparing for an upcoming episode, Ask Me Anything. So please check out the podcast description to find where you can email me your questions or you can reach out to Navicor on social media to send me your questions that way. If you don't already follow us on social media, I'll put all of our handles in the description. Now, my interview with Randy. Hi, Randy. Thanks for being on the podcast today. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. Yeah. So um, this episode is going to be all about kind of student loans and the repayment of student loans because student lo- loans are extremely common among Americans. In fact, um, 42% of Americans who have attended college have incurred a student loan debt and millennials have the most student loan debt out of any generation. So what can millennials do to dominate their student loans? I think the first thing that they can really do is know what kind of loans that they have. I mean, just even having an idea of what type of loans that you have really allow you to tackle repayment of that debt. And once you do figure that out and you're on that good repayment option, really trying to make it a priority within that household budget to pay down the debt as quick as you can, make more than the minimum payment. So that way you're not stuck with this debt for the next you know, 20 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. Because I mean, you know, the original, the initial plan is like a 10 year plan, but sometimes it doesn't work for people. So you kind of want to make sure you're on the right plan and get it paid off as, um, as fast as possible. So I guess I kind of mentioned in the standard repayment plan, but what other repayment options are available for people to pay off their student loans? Well, when it comes to the federal loans, I always like to think of it being broken down into two different categories. So you have the repayment options that are based on your loan balance. An example of that would be like the graduated or the standard repayment plan that you had just mentioned. And then the second area of that would be more of the income-driven repayment options. And this would be the the common income-based repayment, the pay-as-you-earn, the income contingent repayment plan. All of those income-driven repayments would fall underneath that area. So for the the federal loans, think loan balance, think income-driven. When it comes to the, the private student loans, I mean, those are all determined individually. So you'd really have to contact your lender to see what they have available. Um, but it's the federal loans that are broken down into those two types of repayment options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when you begin having to repay your loans, you're only like six months out of college and things can always change. You might get a good job. You might not get a good job. So can a person switch from their initial plan if they feel more comfortable with a different plan? Is that an option for people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing about the repayment options is that when you're sitting down and figuring out that repayment option right after they're in, you know, repayment after that grace period, your financial situation at that point might be completely different within the next year or two years, you know, Mm -hmm. so on. So it's really good to reevaluate that plan um, at least every, I would say, you know, every other year, every few years. And some of those income-driven repayment options, too, if you enroll into that right out of the gate, you're, you're on an income-driven repayment option, you'll find that they're actually going to require documentation from you on a year-to-year basis, which is going to see if you're still eligible for that type of repayment option, what's that going to change to for you? So, you know, even on a year-to-year basis, I would recommend just looking things over, see how your situation changes, see how your repayment option is going to change and figure out if it's going to be the best for you or if it's time to switch. Mm, No, yeah, that makes sense. Especially if you get a good job and you could pay more than 
what your uh, what your do what your what the initial payment is. You can always yeah. switch or just pay more on the minimums a month. Yeah, absolutely. So. And another thing too about just like kind of a side note yeah. about the income driven payment options. Mm-hmm. So that's really common from what I see when people are right out of the gate, you know, just starting a job, you know, looking to increase their income over time. And the the good thing about an income driven repayment option is that it makes it more affordable so that we don't have to worry about defaulting, which is, you know, key to, to manage your payments and also work to continue improving the credit. But the downside mm-hmm. of that is that they have the negative amortization. So sometimes what's happening is your payments are so small that it's not covering the interest. So a mm-hmm. lot of people are like, geez, I'm making my student loan payment, but I actually see that balance go up. And that's why. So if you just keep doing that minimum payment on an income driven repayment option, you're going to see those balances skyrocket. So you might think, hey, I started with X amount of dollars. You might see that increase significantly. So really trying to continue evaluating those repayment options, make more than the minimum payment, even if you are on an income driven repayment option can really be helpful. Yeah. And I I like that you, the point you brought up about your credit because student loans does impact your credit. And for a lot of people, it's kind of the first, maybe even before a credit card, the first thing that they have that's, you know, affecting their credit. Absolutely. I think there's always that uh, perception out there that student loan debt is a good type of debt. Right. Mm -hmm. It is one of the things that's giving you the different forms of debt, which can be a method of of one of the many ways to work on positively impacting your credit. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the amount of debt that student loans really take on that credit report and the amount of those repayment options is very significant. So for someone out of the gate that's just starting, you know, they just graduated college or just Mm -hmm. getting into an entry level position. And having a large amount of student loan debt, a lot of times it can be so overwhelming that it doesn't feel like a good type of debt. You're like overwhelmed, you know, thinking, how can I get into that? So really, you know, trying to figure out that best repayment option so the loans de- don't default is going to be, it's going to be huge. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, were you every, sorry, as I kind of said um, earlier in the podcast, you know, just to go to college, Americans are taking out student loans, even if they go to college for, let's say one or two years and they don't, they don't, um, they, sorry, they don't finish, but they still have their student loan debt. So even though they didn't graduate, how are these people affecting the student loan crisis? I think that as far as just having the debt, it's an extra bill to pay. And Mm -hmm. especially if they were in school for a few years, tuition by semester can rock up really fast. Mm -hmm. So now they're in the workforce, they're getting an entry level position, they're, you know, don't have that college education to get a higher paying job, Mm -hmm. and they're still stuck with paying back such large student loan debt. So even though they didn't graduate, they're still having to make those monthly payments let alone all the other payments that life, you know, has us paying on. And Mm -hmm. they're really stuck on, you know, trying to manage all their bills with a position that might have been higher paying had they had that degree. Yeah. Is it more common, do you think, for people that that happened to, they may not have finished for them not to even make payments or like barely can make the minimum? Absolutely. I mean, Mm -hmm. I see that all the time. And then some people even have a conception like, hey, I didn't finish school. Like, I'm not going to repay my student loan debt. And what they ultimately end up finding on later on is that student loan debt will be repaid, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, especially Mm -hmm. for the federal student loans. So it's really important to try to evaluate your situation at that point, figure out what's going to be that best repayment option so you can really move forward with this debt that you're carrying, even though you didn't obtain a degree. But definitely, you know, I would would definitely say that that's common. I mean, I'm just, yeah. unfortunately, they have this student loan debt. They just don't have anything to show for it. Yeah. No, even going for like a f- few semesters is is uh, expensive. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, you know, millennials have the most uh, right now. They have the most student loan debt of any generation. Um, but then behind millennials is Generation Z, and they'll probably continue the trend of increasing student loans. So what advice would you give a Gen Zer before they take out student loans that will ultimately help or, you know, help the student loan crisis? I mean, as common and, and as little as it sounds, I would say research before you even attend mm-hmm. school. I mean, really just kind of sit down and do like a side by side comparison, like, all right, this is what I'm thinking I might want to do with the rest of my life. And this is how much money I could potentially make from that. And trying to figure out how much student loan debt you can really take on with that type of profession 
like it really is mind boggling compared to the toy, the, the price of tuition nowadays. Right. So really just having that plan or really sitting down and, you know, applying for grants, applying for scholarships and trying to minimize the amount of debt that you're going to be acquiring is going to be key in order to help with lowering down that cost. Yeah. And I think since millennials and soon to be Gen Zers have so much student loan debt, we learn from this and we can kind of give advice when we have kids, you know, about student loans and help them research where maybe our parents who might not have as many student loans as us, they might not have known better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, you know, I'm on the top part of the, you know, millennials and when I was going to college, (laughs) you know, the thing was, hey, you don't have the money for your first day of classes, just take out a student loan. Mm -hmm. And with being young, you're like, all right, well, I want to keep going to school. I want to attend college. I don't want to miss my first day of classes. So let me take out that loan. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you have, you know, people leaving school with these, you know, exit packets of thousands and thousands of student loan debt. So yeah, definitely doing that research, being prepared mm-hmm. and not letting it sneak up on you. So uh, looking at the future, kind of how will the student loan crisis affect both millennials and Gen Zers in the next few decades? I feel like it's like all the trickle down effect, right? So when you think mm-hmm. about, you know, graduating from college, you're like, all right, I need a reliable vehicle so I can get from point A to point B so I can go to work. So potentially getting a vehicle might be hard if you're carrying a large uh, amount of student loan debt, let alone even having enough money for housing, right? Mm -hmm. So the price of rent is continuing to increase. So rent is expensive, let alone having a house, which not only you have to worry about the mortgage (laughs) payment, but all of the expenses that go with it. And even to something that a lot of people don't even think of is with student loans, it may affect how you and your spouse even manage your finances moving forward. So within the next, you know, you know, year or two, you might not be thinking about this, depending on if you're, mm-hmm. you know, in a relationship or not. Right. But, you know, later on down the road, especially if you're going to go that route of any of those income driven repayment options, how you and your spouse file your taxes, you know, manage your money, what your financial goals are, all of that is ultimately going to be impacted. Yeah, that's a good point to bring up, especially if you're trying to make a life with someone else, too. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you and with Go ahead. <laughs> oh, God, sorry. I just going to say too, like with student loans, it's so hard now to even find a spouse that might not even be carrying student loan debt on their own. So really your student loans, their student loans, how you manage your finances, it's really going to impact each other. Not that they do like consolidation loans anymore. They don't do that for the federal loan. So your debt will remain yours. Their debt will remain theirs. But it really feeds off what repayment options might even be available for those loans. Yeah, thinking about that as aspects, you know, when you're younger, you probably don't think about that. Yeah, I know. But it's definitely I think if, you know, younger people listen to this, they'll know, okay, I need to think of that. And that could be something a part of their research when they're deciding what loans are best for them. So I know you kind of you are we already talked about researching loans, but is there um, is there anything else you would tell someone who's deciding on where to go to college as it relates to stu- to needing student loans? I mean, potentially it's an investment, right? So student mm-hmm. loans may be something that someone will have to obtain in order to achieve that that goal for their education. So mm-hmm. really trying to minimize that cost. So I mentioned earlier, applying for grants and scholarships is you know huge. I mean, nowadays mm-hmm. with the internet, you can apply for so many things right. that are out there. So really doing that research. I mean, and a lot of times people are like, well, it takes a lot of time. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. it does take a lot of time, <laughs> but think about how much money you're going to be mm-hmm. saving, how much time in repayment options. So it really does pay off in the long run. And even figuring out, all right, so maybe you have an, an Ivy League school that's your ultimate goal to attend. And I'm just throwing out there for you know a random example. Mm-hmm. Try to do your prereqs where you might be able to use a local community college or a state school. Minimize your costs that way and then transfer appropriate credits for something that would be more major focused. Because mm-hmm. although we all like to think that you know we know exactly what we're going to want to do when we graduate high school, I mean, life is long, right? So you might Mm -hmm. be even finding in the first few years of school, maybe that's something that you didn't really want to do anymore. Maybe there's something else that really sparks your interest and you're like, you know what? I think this is the path I want to go down. So trying to get that information, get the college experience under your belt, right, to begin with, you know, get those, you know, prerequisites done that you can do at any, you know, state or local college, minimize the cost that way, and then if you find something that's going to be more major focus, really, you know, folk, you know, try to go that route at that point. 
Yeah, that is such a great point about the prereqs. I actually did that. I took math at the at the community college here, and I actually took um, a class in high school that was for it ended up giving me six credits for college. So I already went in with six credits, and that is such a good point. You could save money yeah. that way. Do it over the summer or something. Oh, that's, Absolutely. A, that's a good point. No, I love yeah, that well, point. It's really awesome that schools even allow that for kids nowadays, right? Mm-hmm. So you're going to high school, you're still, you know, figuring out, all right, what do I want to do? What do I not want to do? Let me try to figure out, you know, if this is the path I want to go down, take a, a class that might even be somewhat related to that major or just a general, you know, prerequisite in order to to really figure out what's college like, like, are my professors going to be anywhere near like what I had in high school? Like, Mm -hmm. what do I need to do to prepare for school and prepare for getting my homework done? Because it really is, you know, not just about the student loans. It's not just about the major, but it's about life experiences that happen when you're at school too. Definitely. That's a, that's a good point to it, to decide where you want to go to. So, um, if, so let's, if people are struggling to meet the minimum monthly payments on their student loans, where can they go to get help with that? Okay, well, the first thing I have to say is open communication. One of the uh-huh. worst things that I see from people that I talk to on a regular basis is just pushing them to the side, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. I'm just going to, I just can't do it. So I just, I'm going to push it away. Biggest thing is figuring out what are your repayment options. Now, there are some type of agencies like Navicore Solutions. We Mm -hmm. have a a really great option with the student loan counseling. We're all certified through the National Foundation for Credit Counseling in order to give you the best information for the student loans on what might be appropriate for you. But if that's not around and you really want to try to to do it on your own, having that open communication with the lender. So really just talking with them. There's been a lot of progress, even just within the last few years that I've been really focusing on the student loans in Mm -hmm. order to explain repayment options, in order to figure out which one's going to be the best. Um, So really having open communication. And if that's something that you still feel is overwhelming, then looking into the nonprofits like Navicore Solutions, that can really help walk you through it all. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because I feel like people, a lot of people might not even know that's something that we offer or even that's Mm -hmm. available anywhere is student loan counseling. Exactly. And at least, you know, it's with like a certified agency, Mm -hmm. a reputable one. What happened when a lot of the student loan crisis really started to go upward is that a lot of different agencies and companies out there were saying that they had repayment options that could get their loans down to zero dollars per month. So Mm -hmm. what people were doing were paying for these companies to provide their services, paying for them to get the lower monthly payment down. And all they were doing was really posing the federal student loan programs as their own. And it all turned out to be scams. Mm -hmm. So really doing your research to know you're talking with a reputable company and that you're also, you know, having that open communication with the lender too. You definitely want to make sure you're going to, you know, a nonprofit or find somewhere on the NFCC. They could definitely point you in the right direction if you need help. So um, how about the student loan forgiveness program and how is that helping graduates uh, dominate their student loan debt? So I usually get so many questions about the public service loan forgiveness yeah. program. I mean, it's still like a fairly new program. It just mm-hmm. came about with the Obama administration. So it's not an old option when it comes to, mm-hmm. to repayment of this debt. So with the, the public service loan forgiveness program, it's really having the, the government push the new people into the workforce, into the nonprofit sector. So after making 120 qualifying payments, the remaining balance for the loans can be forgiven. So let me kind of break it down this way. Mm-hmm. So when you think of a qualifying payment, there's three major things that need to come in, and all the stars need to align between these three different things. So the first one is working for a nonprofit organization. Right? It does not matter what type of position you do for a nonprofit, as long as you are employed with a nonprofit organization. There is a certain amount of hours that need to be worked per week, but if somebody is doing two part-time jobs with a nonprofit status, I mean, that can even be um, Uh qualifying for this type of payment. So it really is flexible um, and Mm -hmm. it can be intermittent. So with a a job, you know, thinking right out of the gate, maybe get a job at a nonprofit, work there for a little bit, decide that there's a better option or something um, that you want to do that's going to switch to an other nonprofit, you can change employment as long as they're both nonprofit, right? So it doesn't need to stay the same for the full Mm -hmm. 10 years. Obviously, that'd be a long commitment. 
All right. The uh, second type would be the, the right type of loans. So only direct loans are eligible for the public service loan forgiveness program. All right. So that's really big, too. They've seen a lot of people have um, what are called FFEO loans, uh, mm -hmm. federal family education loans. That was the old student loan system that they used, thought they were making payments for the public service loan forgiveness program, found out they didn't have the right type of loan and none of their payments were qualifying. Mm -hmm. Right. So that would be a real bummer. Right. Thinking mm -hmm. that you made the payments for the 10 years. Right. And whoops, that just wasn't happening. Right. And the last thing would be the right type of repayment option. So all the income driven repayment options would be eligible for this public service loan qualifying payment. Now, what you have to do is wait till you have 120 of those qualifying payments. And that's when you apply for the public service loan forgiveness program. Um, a lot of people think, hey, I'm making this payment right now. I'm in the, re the forgiveness program, but you're not, right? You're not mm -hmm. in that forgiveness program until you apply for it with those 120 payments underneath your belt. You're making the payments for that during that time, but you're not in any specific repayment option. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you can do along the way is make sure that your qualifying employer does fill out the employment certification forms. Get those into your student loan lender so you can keep track. So it's not 10 years and you're like, oh, my goodness, where was I working at that point? Let me contact HR there. Right. Um, it really just makes it a whole lot easier. So think of the type of work, the type of loans, the right payment option. And that has those 120 qualifying payments. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. the positive yeah. thing about that, too, just kind of, you know, seeing mm -hmm. one of another benefit is that whatever is forgiven after those 120 payments is not considered taxable income. Okay. What happens is if somebody is on an income repayment option, right? So they might have a, a 20, 30 year repayment time. After that time, if there is a balance on those loans, whatever is forgiven is considered taxable income. So mm -hmm. someone might have a huge IRS debt due at the end of that tax year versus someone who had that public service loan forgiveness program who didn't have to worry about the taxes. So that's like a huge benefit right there. Oh, oh I love that was great. That was a great uh, explanation of this of the forgiveness program. I love that. I've done <laughs> but, it a um, time or two. But, I know. You know so I mean, it's, I know, I'm it's still so processing all of it. I wrote it yeah. all down. So you know, even when I'm on the phone with someone, Katie, I mean, if people are like, "Wait, what? What is this?" Like, and I tend to talk fast, uh, anyways. If you okay. can't tell by by my talking today, but. It is so much information, and that's one of the reasons why people just don't even want to deal with it because yeah, no, they don't have that. any information. But mm -hmm. once you figure it out, it really yeah. is a pretty somewhat easy process right. just to navigate. Oh, right. No, oh, that is that is that's true. Huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I guess the only part of repayment we kind of didn't dis discuss yet is refinancing. So what does it mean if a person's kind of looking to refinance their student loans? And when would you recommend someone do this, if at all? When I think of like refinancing with the student loans, I'm thinking more in the private market sector, right? Okay. So that would be if you had private student loans, if you had a higher interest, let's just say, you know, time has gone by, you've been able to improve your credit your score has gone up and you're looking for a possible lower interest rate, that's when refinancing might be something that you consider researching at that point. When it comes to the federal student loans, they do have consolidation programs that are not like your traditional refinancing. I mean, it's a federal consolidation to have one payment and then it's also to put it on another repayment option that may not be applicable without that consolidation. Um, so we, yeah, I can extend it to the 30, 30, um, the uh, 25, 30 years, depending on the, the type of loans that you have and if, what type of degree that was attained for, whether it was undergrad or grad degree. Um, but for the biggest thing that I would want somebody to walk away thinking about refinancing for student loans mm -hmm. is do not under any circumstances consolidate your federal student loans with your private Okay. Because then you're putting them all together into a private student loan, which may have a higher interest than what your federal student loans do. And then you're taking away all those options of repayment, all those income yeah. contingent, income based, all of that would go away. Mm -hmm. And then also when you think about periods of deferment or forbearance, which is something that the federal student loans offer, not all private student loans offer that. So really keep federal loans private, private loans private 
So mm -hmm. if you have both of those types of student loans, ultimately mm -hmm. you're always going to have two different student loan payments. Right. Right. So if um, it's more for if you have kind of private loans, because you don't want your federal loans to become private loans, because then you lose all the, the things that go with the federal loans, like the different payment options and everything. Exactly. Okay. And another common question that I get, too, is, well, how can I lower down my interest for my federal student loans? Mm -hmm. And quite like, honestly, there's really nothing that you can do that's low going to lower it significantly. Mm -hmm. If you do engage in the consolidation with the federal student loans, what they do is they take your average interest and they weight it to the nearest quarter of a percent. So okay. it doesn't lower down the interest rates on those loans. It's just making them applicable for other repayment options that would be extended. Mm -hmm. So for the federal student loans, those interest rates are determined by Congress. They're not going to get any lower than what you got when you agreed to take them out at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I think that this whole time we kind of talked about how student loans are such a, they can be a burden on a lot of people's lives, especially for a lot of amount of years. They could be super overwhelming and it could definitely take an emotional toll on someone. So how can student loan debt affect kind of like a person's mental health? I would say just like any other financial thing could, you know, affect mm -hmm. it. I mean, yeah. it really is stressful. You know, just even listening to this podcast, I'm sure people are like, oh, my God, I'm stressed out by what I'm even hearing. Like, I can't even deal with this right now. Um, and the thing is just to take it one step at a time, right? Mm -hmm. I always say if you can achieve one thing in a day, that's more than what you had can, you know, achieve the day before. Yeah. So if you can figure out what type of loans you have for one day, that's that day's goal is done. Then move on to something else the next day. Um, it really can be overwhelming when you're dealing with the student loans, you're dealing with credit cards, you know, car payment, mm -hmm. let alone just regular everyday household bills and utilities and exactly. life. So, I mean, it really can be overwhelming very quickly. Yeah, no, it definitely can. And, um, you know, we have a few blogs on the website. I've written one about how just finances in general can affect a person's mental health. I mean, it's crazy. But Absolutely. Yeah, definitely just always... take it. Ooh, go ahead. <laughs> You know, one thing that I always try to think of, too, just kind of on a side note, is that I was taught that emotions come about when a, a goal is blocked, right? You're trying to mm -hmm. do something. It's not happening. It can be frustrating. There's so many emotions that can go with it. And that's the same way with the student loans or any other area of finances. So really just trying to figure out what's going to be the best for you, putting a plan in place. It really is going to lessen that financial burden that you're feeling on yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, and really allow you to move forward with free payment. Yeah. So I think just before uh, you get student loans, do some research. And after you have, um, you know, make sure you're making your payments or anything. But I think that pretty much wraps up uh, all my questions for you. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, as you can tell, Katie, I really like love talking about this. <laughs> it's loans. okay. I love it. <laughs> it's like so much. And, you know, it really is like peeling back layers of an onion, right? You just mm -hmm. kind of keep finding something else and, oh, and yeah. something else happens. And, and that's one of the things that when you work in finances, it makes you yeah. love what you're working with. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it really is exciting. And being able to to share this information, I mean, mm -hmm. that's definitely a plus. Yeah, I think there, we just scratched the surface, honestly, with all student loans. There's probably there's so much you could talk about with it. Oh, my goodness. We could be here all day. I know. <laughs> so I think you pretty much covered a good amount of the basics for everyone. Okay. But we might have to have you back on a later episode to go into it a little bit more. <laughs> hey, I'd love to be back. I've enjoyed talking with you today. I loved it. Well, thank you again, Randy, for being here. All right. Thanks, Katie. Have a good one. <laughs> There are so many aspects of student loans, it's hard to cover everything at one time. I even learned some things I didn't know about student loans during my chat with Randy. Randy provided some awesome information on what to do before you even get to college. I think the idea of taking prereqs either before you start college or over the summer at your local community college is a great way to cut costs. You might not even be sure what you want to major in, so taking those prereqs can help you figure out what you really want to do. Also, if you're having trouble paying your student loans, Navicore Solutions offers student loan counseling. You'll be able to talk to Randy or one of our other counselors, and they would be able to put you on the right track to paying off your student loans. As with any other debt, you need to be patient when paying off your student loans and keep your mental health a priority. And with that being said, this wraps up another episode of Millennial Debt Domination. 
Don't forget to send in your questions for our Ask Me Anything podcast episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel wherever you're currently listening. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you can also go ahead and rate and review the podcast there. I'll talk to everyone in the next episode of our student loan series. Bye. Bye.